morning. Welcome to Spirit Sessions of You, the Light, or Afternoon, wherever you are. Welcome. Big hugs to our whole Spirit Sessions family. You won't believe it. I forgot to bring my sage. I can't believe it. How many shows have I brought my sage? So today I will use my um, smoky quartz and I will raise the vibrations of everyone watching and I will, you know, we don't have any negativity lingering around. And here, look at Rhonda's got what, selenite, you know? Selenite. So we, yeah. we still got you all covered here. So, welcome. Come in for some nurturing. And today we are going to do some brain picking. We have an amazing scientist with us, a, a, a beautiful mind that, that could, you could ask anything you could ask about. You'll see. We can't wait to listen to him. So, Rhonda, tell us about Mark. Hello, everyone. This is Mark Ferentino, and I'm going to let Mark introduce himself. But Mark is, you know, when we were all just kids playing with our toys, Mark decided that Einstein would be his hero. He was born on Einstein's birthday, and he thought, well, I, I think it was you had to figure out what day a saint was born on your birthday. That was a saint day. Well, there was no saints born on Mark's birthday except the saint, the patron saint of physics, um, Albert Einstein, which I would call. So he decided that Einstein would be his hero, and that's how he got connected at the first place with him. And that's kind of a strange starting point for any child. Like, oh, Einstein. And, and it just has spiraled from there, Mark, hasn't it? It's just gone on from there. And, uh, well, most of us, when we retire early, we think about gardening and, and you know, golfing. Mark's decided to take on a, a problem that has Einstein didn't get to solve, which was the unified field theory. And I can't even say it properly today. So Mark, <laughs> please give us a little bit of, sorry, COVID brain. Please give us a little bit of your background and how you ended up um, with this wonderful theory evolving into something that actually is re-put re back together into a cohesive unit of, of things that make sense. Sure. Well, I'm, I'm a self-taught metaphysician, so I'm not, you know, I'm not a physicist. I want to make that clear. Although I studied physics and I studied philosophy, in particular, concentrating deeply on uh, uh, classical physics like uh, Einstein had in mind, and Maxwell, and Newton, uh, and uh, Lorenz, and Faraday, you know, there were the key guiding factors in their work. I followed that path, Einstein's path, uh, to a natural conclusion. So over the years of much thinking and much reading and, and uh, study, I came to the conclusion Einstein for the most part was right he was on the the right path although he kind of still in some ways denied a physical continuous ether substance that space was made of uh, he used formulas that kind of used that uh, idea even though he did not want to directly claim that there was an ether except in one speech that he made to uh, Lorenz in the Netherlands uh, in 1920, where he then said there was an ether. Uh, so I, I just worked that problem. And over time, I found out by reading some of his other work uh, that he was looking for the same things that I was looking for, uh, that being a geometry, a dynamical geometry that would explain uh, how particles develop mass. And I did find that geometry uh, eventually uh, in a near-death experiencer's experience. And, um, and then I was able, once I saw how it looked, I was aware of its model, and then I followed through and created the math and wrote the paper that explains exactly how particles all particles generate mass and why the one particle that doesn't have any mass doesn't generate mass. It all fits together nice and neat and orderly and sensibly, unlike the many explanations and interpretations that come from quantum mechanics, which never really makes sense. 
So that's how I got to this point. I decided uh, to write about all this. And after four years, uh, I had a completed book. And then from there, I started going out and talking about it. You know, well, who's going to promote this? If it isn't me, I don't know who is. <laughs> it's my job, my responsibility. And I accept that as part of my life now. And that's how we got here. So you, your theory, uh, you put it out there. And so other scientists are now looking at it and arguing and debating and everything like what always happens. Yes, I, you know, I try what I could do. I put out, it's a 50 page paper and research gate. There's one that precedes it uh, that I use. I determined something. I had to determine this and I determined the speed of which quarks move inside of neutrons and protons. And uh, I, I developed this oh. model, you see, this is what was seen by the near-death person who, who was oh. in the presence of God. And this, with some other geometries, uh, is what she saw. It's the called trinity. A, tr a, tr trinity. Not, a tr trinity. So there's a mm -hmm. weird sort of um, something going on with the trinity. Somehow, they back in those days, they made a connection. The three dimensions, the three... The, this not as a trofoil line, and I knew when I l started looking for it that I was it was going to be something. This geometry had three elements in it, and sure enough, what that woman, Lynn Claire Dennis, saw in her near death experience was that surround with a sphere and some other geometric objects all around it, and. God telling her, I am the source, you know, the sun, the energy. I, I am the energy that forms mass and matter. Clearly what I was looking for. So I actually did the search expecting to find this in a near-death experience, and I did. And it makes sense. And I, I worked with those people for a while. Um, unfortunately, uh, even though she's a near-death experiencer, she's agnostic which I found very shocking. And, you know, I tried to say, you know, I, ha I seem to have more faith in, in what you've experienced than you have. But it's just because she works with scientists and who they've gotten involved with the whole geometry and all and the mathematics. And those people influenced her thinking into mm -hmm. being one who's now agnostic and doubting her own experience. But I don't doubt it. I think it was the real deal, and I think she brought back an important message, one that I know I needed and I incorporated into my book. So the, it's a long process with lots of, you know, fractal little uh, connections that brought all this theory together, like the first paper I wrote where I found, uh, this was like four or five years, I just got this idea that I needed to solve this. And I wrote this paper up and I used all these Lorentz transformation formulas. And I was able to determine that these particles that are moving in th the quarks are moving in this pattern inside a neutron and proton. But not only is it moving like this, it's rolling and spinning. So mm -hmm. what you get is a sphere like mm -hmm. Lynn Claire saw <laughs> in her near death. They were associated together. And this, the rotating sphere is the perfect geometry to develop the contraction of space around this rapidly rotating sphere. So that's where gravity, mass, uh, come from. It's is that, an inertial. Is that, why, is that why planets are round? Uh, you know, the, the roundness and the collection, of, you know, the way the that gravity contra contracts, you could think of it as space is bent with all the arrow force arrows of gravity pointing toward the center of the sphere. So yeah, your objects, your mass of objects, when there's a origin or a source of a gravitational pull is going to be spherical every time in a three dimensional universe. And so all your planets, all your stars, you know, there's no square stars. There's no, you know, that, that, that's, that just isn't supported by the way the force of gravity works. It's going to collect into a nice orderly sphere. 
just like this thing is doing. It comes from that, from the microscopic to the macroscopic. The same deal applies as particles condense, they condense in a spherical shape. And, and so it, it's all very sensible. It makes perfect logical sense, the theory of super relativity, which is basically an extension of Einstein's ideas and a completion. So is there like a three word or no, I shouldn't say it, three sentence um, explanation of this, the, of the theory, the super relativity theory? Is there something that you can just say to someone well, and they kind of get it? It, it is the unified field dummy. theory. Yeah, the unified so, field theory. So I'll define the unified field theory. Basically, electromagnetism and gravity emerge as aspects of a single fundamental field. They're just bendings of the fundamental field. So there's space, according to super relativity, is, is an ether. It, it is a quasi-elastic solid. So I'm just going to leave that for right now and then, and then ask answer the, the super relativity theory. Uh, it's a metaphysical theory. So as a metaphysician, it's as a type of a philosopher. And um, basically what this means is I have studied the fundamental nature of reality. In other words, I studied the nature of things as they exist. So in my book, I, I talk about the many aspects and implications to the theory of super relativity. Super relativity is a reality model. It's a mechanical thing that you can see and imagine. And it's a philosophy that deals with the first principles of this material world. This includes as abstract concepts such as being, knowing substance, cause, identity, time, and space. The theory over the years has evolved into a unified th field theory as Einstein first envisioned that sentence I just told you about. Electromagnetism and gravity emerge as the aspects of a single fundamental field. This all makes sense. So the theory of super relativity says, yeah, there is an ether, despite what modern day physics thinks. There, it's a quasi-elastic solid. Quasi meaning that if you bend it a little bit using a force like magnetism or an electrostatic field, it deforms and moves a little bit and deforms into the shape. And when you remove the force, it's square flat Euclidean space. Just you just imagine there's no bending at all, and it's all equal. Uh, the force and, and measurements are, are all isotropic, all the same everywhere. Uh, so that uh, elastic means you can bend it a little. Quasi means if you bend it, it snaps back when you remove the force. So quasi elastic solid. Solid is the one that really trips up a, a lot of people. Solid in this case, in its pure sense, means that which is continuous. It's not made up of parts. It is the foundational part, the foundational substance, which everything is built from. And how they manifest is through their bending. So particles are really just ultra tiny little fields, electrostatic fields, really, that have motion. And when they move through space, they cause it to bend, either magnetically or gravitationally. So that's, that's as crushed down as I could get the theory to be and as many <laughs> sentences I can, of course, go into more detail. But basically, the final summation of all this gravity uh, is a contraction of space caused by, in this case, for neutrons and protons, their rest mass is caused by the quarks moving in this manner. And there is a sentence I use to describe that which goes like this. These are fundamental particles that are unbalanced charges, meaning they're not you know, equal amounts of negative and positive charge to one or the other, negative or positive. So they're fundamental unbalanced charges. And when they move in an accelerated manner, anytime you move in circles or bends or you know, have angular momentum that's accelerated, when you move in that manner, space contracts in and around 
those moving particles. So you get that sphere because it's rapidly rotating a trefoil pattern, which is spinning and, 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 and rolling. And uh, you get a rapidly moving sphere and around the edge of that sphere is contraction, all pulling inward toward that sphere. And that's where gravity comes from. This is the first complete explanation of how gravity works, the model itself. And that's what the mathematics I put into my second paper describes this phenomena mathematically and proves because I get the right answers for the neutron and the proton using formulas that come from Newton's time, mm -hmm. a moment of inertia. It all makes sense. I can, and I step through it and explain it step by step. So simply, even a physicist can understand it. <laughs> Whether they will believe it or not, the ones that I've talked to so far were, were shocked and could not believe that something could come from things that are just in motion. But that's isn't yeah, isn't space always in motion? Is is space in that motion? Is space a sphere? S space is stationary, according to Lorenz uh, and people of the time before ninth, the year 1905. The space isn't moving. Uh, this, as a particle moves through space, what's moving, it's not like a bullet through air where the bullet is displacing the air around it as it moves. It's as if the bullet itself is in the air. Let's just put that model aside. A particle is a field, a twist of space, a vortex. And that vortex is persistent. It doesn't dissolve and melt, melt away. And this is an indication that space is a solid because you can't build that kind of structure in a liquid or a gas. It'll dissipate. But in a solid, it maintains its structure. And so as it moves through space, a particle is a twist, it's moving through space. That structure develops within that structure, let's say an electron or something, a cause of motion, which Einstein was looking for. And I, I found, and I call that cause of motion, the slip wave. And so there's a pressure gradient from the front of the particle to the back created within the medium of the ether. So the particles are consubstantial with the ether. What do I mean by that? It means they are of the same thing. They are made up of, they are the same thing as the ether. The only difference is why we detect them and we can see them is they're deformed. And this is something that's viewable, detectable with equipment and in our eyes and so forth. It has to move to see it like it's like- you're, What it's, breathes life into the universe is the motion. And I realized this and I continued to look for Einstein ever thinking or saying this. And he does in one of his unified field theory papers of gravitation and electricity. He says it in the last two sentences. After he wrote all these equations, all this stuff for the unified field theory, he then says, nevertheless, I'm still far away from claiming the physical validity of the equations I derived. The reason for that is that I did not succeed in deriving equations of emotion for particles yet. He was on to the same idea. That creates the universe. If particles don't move, nothing happens. Magnetic field, this is, electrostatic field is a particle, it's a charge. All particles are made of charge. They're twists of space. These twists are forced to move because of their structure. When they move, space does this as the particle is moving. It rotates. That's the magnetic field, two thirds of the way to the, to the um, unified field theory. Then I came up with the last part. The last sensible explanation is more motion specific type accelerated motion causes the contraction of space so you get a, a charged particle that's you know, moving and it's moving in a circular amount now it's accelerating acceleration causes the contraction of space it causes space to contract that's mass that's the gravitational field so now it's all linked and it all happens because force is in motion that's what we call that energy 
that energy forms mass just as god said to lynn claire i am the energy that forms mass he intentioned this physical reality he created the whole thing not just people on earth not just you know in seven days i mean the entire universe right down to the last atom was intentioned and created by the creator and if you want to know how things work at some point scientists are going to have to start asking the creator that means they're going to have to start believing in the existence of the person that created them and everything else and this stuck in the sand head kind of a uh they don't believe and they're agnostic or they're atheists this is just old style uh thinking it's it's a kind of willful ignorance where they do not want to believe that you know there's something greater than themselves and mankind well there is and it would be hard to explain without something like mm -hmm. just like the existence well so, and, and there's loads of people that have had near-death experiences where god tells them i created everything and i have an example on of that on my website my blog father rick wendell he lays it he lays it right out uh, he says, all of this three-dimensional world is within God. It's, we're within God. We're part of it right now to the last atom. So we're in the mind of God. Almost. Yes. There is nothing outside of God. Everything within this physical universe has to correspond to laws. And God set those laws. They are immutable as God is immutable. None of this, what we see and experience is an accident. It is intentioned by God. We're inside of the mind of God. This, the matrix, you want to call it something that modern day people call it? You want to call it the matrix? It's the same thing. We're inside of a shared dream. And uh, it's up to us to figure it out and, and learn and have positive experiences whenever we can generate them. Because our God's gift to us, humanity, each and every individual person is your life. Your gift to God is what you do with it. So everything you do, say, think is important. Everything, everyone does. And, and you're going to bring back those experiences that becomes part of the Akashic record, uh, the book of life, whatever you want to call it, as your, your gift, your return gift to God. So, you know, make it a good one. So, you know, that's part of what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to contribute positively in a way that helps people figure out what's going on here in advance, not just technologically, but spiritually and emotionally. So if the Akashic records in your unified field theory exists then. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's a place. The spirit realm exists. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, an, a higher dimension, and this is where we get into the idea of what's it made of? Well, it's a higher dimension, so I'm not really sure. Uh, but it seems to, when you're in this dimension, you have full capacity, full powers. You can move at the speed of a god. You can think, and you're there. Uh, and that could be the other side of the universe, in another universe, in another dimension, in another time. Because when you're on the other side in the spiritual realm, as far as I've been able to determine, you're outside of time, as is God. And, and so you can access the future, the past, the present, as many NDEs have come back and testified to. So there's so confirmation. <laughs> I was going to say, how did you get on to NDEs? How did you, how did you go, oh, these are the people. What sparked that interest? Sorry. <clears throat> oh, I read the book by Raymond Moody many years ago, and I thought, this is important because we're talking about the greater picture, the reality, and did we come from somewhere? Do we exist beforehand, you know, the pre-life, the pre-birth, uh, and the afterlife? Uh, it's part of the bigger picture, which, you know, people are wondering, I know I wonder, where did I come from? Uh, is, do I disappear when I die, you know? Uh, and, and this kind of fit in, this made sense, near death. What, what, was the, what was the title of that book? Somebody was asking. Uh, oh, um, was asking. 
Raymond Moody. I mean, I can look it up real quick. Uh, very popular title. Uh, yeah. You know, I always it's a strict. It's um, it's kind of and mind blowing, and it's always been life after life. I think was the name. Life of the after book. life. Okay. Yeah. What was the one? I, oh, I can't remember now. The other one. By Newton, but he was a doctor. He wasn't a physicist. He did uh, life. Um, Cheryl, Cher, Sherry says, I've been struggling with being raised Baptist about God's, the God of person, soul, or energy. Growing up, you never see pictures of God, only Jesus. So mm -hmm. she, she's been struggling with that. So, um, I could tell you what I've learned from near-death experiences about Jesus, uh, some famous ones. And clearly there is an index. See, we are humans. And what is a human? Humans are avatars. Mm -hmm. uh, so wh who are you, really? You are not your brain and you are not your body. The brain and the body house the spirit while you're in this form. And when you go inside it, when you are born, uh, you're throttled down. Your soul powers, you know. You're disconnected somewhat from God, and you have to work your way back through meditation or whatever to reestablish that connection. And so you're limited by design so that you have to struggle to get through life. It's not supposed to be easy. And God actually says that in Indira. That's experience to somebody who's complaining and saying, I don't want to go back. It's hard there. And he yells at, well, bellows, you know, that the whole universe shook and says to her, it's supposed to be hard. It's the whole point. Mm -hmm. So this material world has its limitations that enable possibilities of ignorance and suffering and joy and learning and discovering, all of which is, is not so easily or if any possibly done on the other side because it's a perfect realm with a complete connection to God and to love and everything. So G Jesus is reincarnated, reincarnated into his avatar here for this planet. But according to uh, some other near-death people, uh, he also has done that on every, he claims to have done it on every planet Everywhere in this universe and all other universes. And so well, how does he do that? He comes down in their avatar. Mm -hmm. And then their experience is not going to be the same as ours where he's put up on a cross. Probably not anything like that. There's all kinds of different things. But the purpose, the function is the same. It's to teach those people, that group, that make and model of per people about the spirit life and the the that, spirit realm and that there's more than physical there's a spiritual yeah part of us. there's a yeah that it's, it's it's a place i you know i, I want to say it is a place uh it's at a higher dimension it's it's been described to me as it's not so much above us but it's right alongside mm -hmm. in parallel sort of and just at a higher frequency and and then if you can switch to that frequency, then you can see and, and sense and feel, and then you're connected to it. Uh, so somehow there's a lot of dimensions apparently all going on at the same time, just at higher frequencies or whatever. And so there's, there's a lot of stuff that I don't get into too much in my book about that. The spirituality part, only a little. A second book I probably... I'm going to go into that all heavily. These discussions that we're having here are all going to be in that book to answer those kind of questions. Show us a picture of your book, Mark, and, and, and describe your book and where people can find it. Because I, I, I love, okay, so when I saw this, I knew, knew exactly, I'm going to let the audience, I looked at it and I said, I know that album cover. <laughs> so anybody here in the audience recognize yeah. That That's image from an album cover, think um, mm -hmm. 70s, right? It was in the yes, 70s, 70s right? yeah. Yeah. So some of you might not be in the 70s, but 
my I have an older sister, and this was one one of the ones that I was fascinated with. We used to have to listen to record players all the time, so yeah, we couldn't. And since yes. they were older, we got to listen to their music. Yeah, that that does. Have, have they all guessed? Have they made their guesses? No, it says, I, Lisa said it looked like Merlin. I agree. I think it looks like Merlin too. Oh, absolutely, it looks like Merlin. Yeah. Oh yeah, I, I, yeah. It's kind of what I asked the, the mm -hmm. artist to do. A wonderful lady who <laughs> lives in Spain. Melinda, you should know. Um, she says I don't have her glasses on. You have to show it again. You have to show it again. So <laughs> look, look, Melinda. Sherry says Pink Floyd. Well, not, a <laughs> not a bad guess. Not a bad guess. Okay, we'll have to. You'll have to tell us where. Right. where, where it you comes that. from. The Every good boy deserves favor. Moody Blues album, uh, which has a lot of great songs on it. Yeah. Uh, as soon as I saw that years ago as a kid, so I said, someday I'm going to use this somewhere. I didn't know. <laughs> but it, it really resonated with me. I, I looked at it and it said, this just means something. This is important. Uh, you know, I, I, I just resonated with it. So eventually I gave the person, the artist, that picture. I said, I want you to make this again, except do it. Okay. Uh, like this. Yeah. Describe describe what um, Merlin's holding or whoever's holding there. Oh, you got you got to make some rocking t-shirts out of that. Yeah. <laughs> there's there's three. I'd be number one in line for that one. I, actually, I I do have a a hat here. Let me go get oh, it. Hold on. Awesome. Hold on a second. I'll show you the hat. Yeah. That's cool. Do you remember that album, Teresa? You would be younger too. Yeah. Yeah. No, I actually like the Moody Blues. Yeah. Oh yeah, I love oh, that. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. That is so Celtic, right? Eh? Now I wonder if the, so, I said that is so Celtic. That that is so Celtic. The the symbolism there too, and I'm I'm just wondering how the Celts knew about that. And it's perfect. The I designed this and had somebody in New York just perfect it and draw it oh, as awesome. I as I envisioned it. Uh, the triangle represents the three dimensions of space. So the two other structures you see in here, the trefoil knot, which we went over, creates the sphere, which creates gravity, which creates mass. And then all of the universe appears. So it's got a sphere. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, I call it the signature of God. The signature of God. Uh, oh the other side, who's talked to me about it through a medium, they called it the breath of God. Wow. And um, they confirmed that this is all right. So I've done things that a scientist would never do. I've consulted the creator through mediums, through NDE people to get some of this information. I would say you consciously consulted them. I think. Yeah, willfully, I think consciously. I think, yeah, you, you. You, uh, with your own mind, decided not that sometimes God, I think, um, how would you say, downloads, influences, yells, whispers to them, and finally they go, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. You, you <laughs> have to um, but listen. you acknowledge that. Yeah, I, I listen. I've learned to listen to my spirit guides. I have not always done that, and it almost cost me my life at, at one point because I, I refused to listen to a warning. And I almost died that day because I listened. I did not listen to the warning, and I did what it said not to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, only because I was made aware of a danger that was coming was I able to avert the car crash, a head-on collision, uh, because I knew something was coming because of what happened. Uh, would you like to hear that story? Yes, for sure. Yeah. I love love stories. Um, this is part of my experience learning how that there are guardian angels. And uh, I was driving home from IBM from work and I hit an intersection. It's a T intersection. I can go left or I can go right, but I have to go one or the other. There's no straight through. Uh, left goes through the quiet country roads. I usually chose that to relax. Or I can go right. It's a little bit quicker, but it's a lot more lights and a lot heavier traffic. And 
it's kind of a pain to go that way. And sometimes you get home sooner, sometimes you get home later. Uh, so I went left. But as I was approaching that intersection, I'm thinking to myself, well, which way? Are you go? I'm going to go left today. And as soon as I thought that, I heard a voice in the left ear. Now, I'm not talking in my head like the thought voice that you hear when you think. I'm talking as if somebody were right next to my ear and speaking to me. And that person, as a male, said, don't go that way. And I, you know, I'm in my car by myself. I whip around to see if there's somebody in the back seat. There's nobody there. And so I, I just shook it off and stuck. I don't know what that was. I, I, and then he said again, don't go that way. So I'm sure I'm hearing this and it's, it's a voice, <laughs> but there's nobody there. So I'm figuring, well, this sounds like a warning. I got to know that this is real, I thought. So I went that way. <laughs> Don't because do that. the scientist <laughs> kind of guy in me says, it couldn't be. That just doesn't happen. This is not a part of what's normal. And so I was kind of, you know, self-doubting a little bit, even though I was sure I experienced, I heard a voice. And so I'm saying, well, if it's going to be a bad thing, it's going to be a head-on collision. So I'm going to be looking ahead, watching ahead for any kind of weird something coming. Well, about three quarters of the way home on a two-lane road, a straight stretch, uh, I see this truck starting to swerve, a pickup truck. And he's going into our lane, out, off the road, comes back on the road, goes into our lane, goes off the road. He's doing it over and over as if he's trying to hit somebody head on and of course people are going the guy in front of me he goes a van he goes into the the ditch and then i see he's coming right at me and i turn the wheel as hard as i can and i go into a ditch and we miss i see the truck going by his side and my side and i'm looking as it goes by and then i wind up in this ditch spun around and he spun and stopped in the middle of the road and i thought to myself Mark, the next time somebody tells you not to go that way, don't go that way. <laughs> and I apologize. And to this day, I apologize to my guardian angels who were just that guardian angel's job is to keep me alive. Right. Make sure I don't exit before I finish everything that I have to do. Uh, so. Good, wise words. Yes. Um, that is, that wow. gives me goosebumps. Mm -hmm. um, Melinda's asking, curious if Mark has heard of Rama School of Enlightenment, a school of quantum physics. No, uh, no. Um, I'm not a big quantum physics fan. And like Einstein, I have a lot of problems with it. So when people start snapping or connecting the word quantum or quantum mechanics or quantum physics, I tend to um, shy away because there's a problem philosophically that I have with uh, the interpretations coming from quantum mechanics. They're, they're incorrect. They're nonsensical. They're not right. And, and how do I know that? Because for one thing, they don't just have one. They have like 27 or more different explanations from reality and everybody's just spinning off of other people's ideas and they're all throwing rocks at each other from the hill saying, no, it's my way. No, it's my, none of those ways are right because there is no such thing as a force of probability. There is, things don't happen because of probability. Probability happens because of determination. And so there's a big, big void between us, me, and quantum mechanics, as Einstein had the same problem. It's an incomplete system. So there's a lot of interesting applications that come from quantum mechanics, but I, I, I'm i not familiar with their, you know, they may have some good ideas in their, in their philosophy or whatever, because there certainly is an aspect in our reality that does appear to be random, but that's only the appearance. And all things that have appearance are not necessarily true. So, for what that's worth. 
So, yeah, so kind of, um, I guess one of the things that quantum physics says by observing something, you've already changed. And that's true. I don't argue with that. Uh, they don't take it far enough, though. They kind of discredit that idea in some ways. The observation, it's called the measurement problem. The observation does affect the things you, you're observing. So if you're trying to watch, let's say, an electron move through space, in order to do that, you got to fire photons at it and bounce off of it and then get that back and say, oh, it was here. Oh, it was there. Oh, now it's here. Now it's there. And every time you do that, you affect the flight of the electron or whatever particle because you're interacting with it. And, and at that level, that scale, it's a big interaction. You know, it's deflecting and moving in different directions. So as you observe it, you mess up the observation. So... You, you mess up its, its position, you mess up its momentum, you, you know, and so those things are hard. You can't get both at the same time. As soon as you observe it, you mess it up. But they want to say that's, that's an intrinsic thing. It's, no, well, it's, it's really more, not, not so intrinsic. It's just the way we work. It's a limitation of our physical reality unless we can find a way to observe something without disturbing it. And I know, I don't know of a way to do that other than spiritually. Uh, one could look at things and see them uh, in a mind experiment and not to disturb anything in that experiment because it's, it's just part of your consciousness and you're not acting on that uh, real object, let's say an electron or something. Like Although bacteria. some psychics could affect a particle, you know, healers do and, and so forth. So there's still a disturbance, uh, but you would have to do it as a remote viewer and, and, and watch it in a passive way. And uh, other than that, with scientific equipment, you're going to mess up the thing, the observation, uh, the, the particle velocity or it's position by observing it yeah there's no way going through the door with it going through the door um, more or less yeah. right That's yeah it's um it's uh, an unfortunate thing of this physical reality you, you've got to learn you know you, you're trying to the universe is a black box so there's something in there you're trying to identify right well then you start doing things with the black you shake the box it's a rattle uh, you weigh the box as a have mass. You do. You heat the box. You cool. Every time you do something, you're affecting the box or what's mm -hmm. inside of the box. It's just the nature of the physical reality, and you have to learn to adjust to that and make interpretations, realizing that's part of the uh, observation that you're affecting it. Oh, I like what Lynn Marie said. Um, she said, someone is spinning all this quantum quagmire. On the first appearance, it's chaotic, but so precisely positive and negative that it comes together in a literal amazement when when reviewing. So it comes together in yeah. chaos. Um, it's ca chaos is what makes the whole thing confusing, what makes mm -hmm. it all appear to be random. You know, in the microscopic world, everything is easily affected by the things all around it each particle you know as it whizzes through space it's going through air it's going near oxygen it's going near hydrogen it's going near uh, the other things and it's slightly deviating and 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 so there's there's effects on you know photons as they travel through space and uh, other particles in, in your in liquid and so forth they're very chaotic but that doesn't mean that it's not sensible, it's not deterministic. It's just impossible to compute with any kind of Newtonian equations uh, because there's just so much there. You're just never aware of all that's going on in a system like that. And, and so it's impossible to predict with standard calculations, the path of a particle or whatever, uh, because there's so much going on at that level that's, you know, not accessible, not fully, we're not fully aware of. And that's just the nature of our physical reality. It's a limitation. 
and it's something we just got to learn to live with and and do we can the quantum mechanics sort of looks magical because they do measurements in groups huge groups then they calculate the probabilities and odds and yeah you can get the right answer for particle collisions or whatever because you do millions of measurements and you'll get so many of these and so many of those and so many of those and when the equations don't match up right you know what they do they tune them with 27 or so ad hoc tuning parameters so ooh, our equations that we have right now didn't really quite ma match the measurements we've seen here in the lab what if i put this one in and that one in and i keep tuning it until i get the right answer it's not really a great system. It sort of sounds like my mother's recipes. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't <laughs> yeah. quite taste right until we yeah. add this parameter, yeah. this number, and multiply yeah. it in. And then, then it works. Uh, yeah. It's like, yeah, how my aunt used to hand down recipes with a few things missing. Um, Mark, so uh, before we let you go, tell us again where people can find your book and show it again because we love the album cover. and. I mean, the album cover, the book cover. Yeah. Uh, Which I, I really want to see this on a t shirt now. Yes. I really do. Oh, I, no, I have a t shirt, but it's of the planet. Yeah, we want to see that picture. That would be awesome. Anyway, I'm uh, Okay. Uh, um, there is a t shirt I sell on my website and the hat along with the book. With the, and they're the all article on, thing. They're yeah. all on www.super dash relativity.com super hyphen relativity.com uh, is where you can get the book a signed copy or if you want to get the amazon you can get the amazon from amazon or you could get the kindle if you like kindle uh, we want to hear it in audiobook soon so. yeah i need to look into that and see you know it's going to yeah. take me a long time to read this book <laughs> aloud. <laughs> get, get a voice actor. You but know. If, they, if, if Audible provides the stuff, I, yeah. I'll give it a try. You know, I say, hey, you give us a tape of this and we'll put it up in an audio book. If it's that simple, I guess I can do it. Yeah, I'm not sure how it goes, but it's it's pretty cool. I guess you choose the uh, voice actor. Yeah. Awesome, awesome idea. Um, so you can get all Mark's... Um, links in the um in in the video description here and if you're listening on our podcast you can just look at our podcast and all his links will be there um i want to give a shout out to jim perry who of course i interviewed you first before us but i heard him and i had to listen to that podcast twice to get it um to listen to you and i thought it was so so amazing that you tied god into science so neatly and and mm -hmm. uh, like, yeah, that, that's where science and God should be together from the beginning. Like, I agree. All created from one source. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much. Um, Bex, you have some questions for Mark. Yeah, now that my brain's back to somewhat functioning, I had a brain melting moment in the Yeah, I know. Well, because you mentioned that, you know, we're in the mind of God. And so then I'm like, oh, my God, we're the imagination of God. And then our imaginations are being created and they're, you know, going to become reality. And then it just became that fractal moment of going, you know, just continuing down the rabbit hole. And I just, my brain, my brain melted. <laughs> was gone. The mirror through the mirror through the mirror. Yeah, yeah. You're, like, you're, oh you're, we're, you're grappling with the same problem I had. Where do mm -hmm. thoughts come from? Yeah. yeah. And, and basically so far what I've come up with is their memories. They're triggered mm -hmm. by memories. And then the thought comes forward in some sort of random way or pseudo random way. But uh, that's as energy? far as I've gotten so far. Well, they so say far. we have repetitive thoughts every day. Like what most of our thoughts are repetitive. So that makes sense. We don't really yeah. have a lot of new thoughts, you know, so. But new thoughts, I think, come from inspiration, mm -hmm. from help from the other side. And, you know, creation comes yeah. from the creator and, and the creator comes through us either directly uh, or through an intermediate person, uh, you know, a spirit guide or um, spirit guide or guardian mm -hmm. angel, something of that nature. So there's that aspect. Yeah. And I fully believe in that. And I fully use that and uh, don't apologize for it. I will never apologize because that's the way it is. That's the way it works. Mm -hmm. And let's all learn to do it and advance yeah 
It's all about the whole. Mark will be up there saying, I told you so. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, so do you agree that we are the creator in human form? We are a part of the, we're not the creator ourselves. We are mm -hmm. a part, uh, a thought. I've heard it dis described as, you know, maybe we're a thread in the tapestry mm -hmm. uh, of God and our lives are threads in our tapestry. So you see the fractal kind of thing that's going from all of this, how it builds, you know, this tapestry is a part of a strand of the bigger God tapestry, you know, sort of like the drawings behind you there. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's very complicated because you're, we're trying to understand in a finite form, uh, infinite, uh, infinite mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. eternal things, you know, like where did God come from? Well, he was always here. How could he always be here? There must be a beginning because we all in this world only have beginnings and endings. Uh, we're not a familiar with forever on anything. Nothing lasts forever here in this universe. Nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Except the universe itself. But it oscillates. And that's in well, our book. Wouldn't there be a creator of the creator then? Like it just keeps going. I know, it's hard. It just keeps going. And my brain is just not. Okay, let's get to the questions because I'm going to have another meltdown in a second. <laughs> I know. You're, <laughs> you're experiencing my three year old self thinking about the creator yeah, of the creator. Just, yeah, I know. It's too much. It's too much. Yeah. Okay. First question If you had to choose a song to be the theme song of your life, what would that be? Well, uh, the song, individual song I would pick would be Go Now because of the dream I had. I don't know if you want to go through the whole dream, but I had this dream with a witch, freezing lightning bolts, killing everybody, freezing my brothers. I free myself, destroy the witch, but I'm walking home from the lake, crying because my friends are dead and my brothers are frozen. Then the song Go Now from the Moody Blues comes into the dream. And then all of a sudden I look behind me and my friends are alive and my brothers are breaking free from the ice uh, the frozen ice statues that they were and I'm happy and then I wake up and here's where things get a little strange I go to the window and look out the backyard to see if it was real I'm about 10 years old and you know so there I am with my eyes wide open and I'm <laughs> looking out to see if what happened in my dream was real and then the music is playing from the radio my mom's making breakfast and so just after that, my father comes home and say, we're moving to Florida. So that song becomes a, like a harbinger of things and the oh. good things that are going to happen. Mm -hmm. But I, I can never get this song and that dream out of my mind. For the next five years, 1970, I go to the store looking for this book every weekend, I'm looking for this song. And one weekend I find the song on a new album put out by the Moody Blues, which is now 1970. This is 64, 65 when I heard the song. 1970, I'm 15 or so. And I see there's a picture of a boy with his eyes wide open and behind him is like a sunrise kind of thing. And I see on the label, it says dream. And I get all excited and I whip around the book the, the thing in Go Now is the first song on it. So I bring it home. I buy it, bring it home, tell my mom all about it. I said, I had this dream, and, and this is, and, and it's a boy on the book, just like me that was looking out the window. And um, I looked at the label again. It didn't say dream, it said Durham. <laughs> but I saw Dream. <laughs> and, and so that's the rest of the story. So that song, you know, I associate with my life in general. If I hear that song, something good is going to happen. And, uh, but then there's the song that I associate with super relativity and, and that's New Horizons by the Moody Blues. And then the song for my mission in life, I associate with um, my song by the Moody Blues, mm -hmm. which talks about aliens and life and just making discoveries so it's kind of my theme for for my my life's purpose is to make awareness of the aliens the alien technology and spiritualism and god and how well, that's, they that's a whole other show where yeah, that'll be another episode <laughs> so that's sure. that. that's the song question <laughs> answer yes yeah. 
if we're coming up to alien season in, in, in my part of the world, it's in the fall usually when they come mm -hmm. in. So come down to visit. So go ahead. Back yeah, to that. that was very cool. Thank you for yeah. that. Okay. Uh -huh. Second question is what is, what's your favorite crystal? Oh, emerald. Mm -hmm. Emeralds. I just think they're beautiful. Green. Yeah. I like that green. They are absolutely gorgeous. Okay. Third question. Have you ever experienced extra dimensional intelligence, UFOs, visitations? Yeah, uh, several times. Briefly, once in Miami, uh, while I was out at the pool at night, me and some other people looked up. We, in Miami, the night sky, there's no stars. It's just too much light pollution. But they were very bright. They were the only things in the sky, seven of them, one over the other, bobbing up and down slowly. And then one by one, they went whoosh, 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 straight up was in the newspapers the next day, thousands of people saw it. The next mm -hmm. time I had a, an encounter, it was a very close encounter. I woke up in the middle of the night to get some water. And I, I saw this um, green and red flashing lights outside of the house. And there was a big oblong shape thing over the lake about 50 to 75 yards from my house. It was big as my house. And I woke up my wife and I got her and made her look. And we looked at it for about five minutes until it slowly drifted off to the west. So those are my two, two classic UFO, definitely UFOs. They were unidentified. They were not anything of this earth, in my opinion. Mm, that's awesome. That's one, of the, one of the other images of God, that's what yes. I would say. Yeah. yeah um, and, of course, I, I, I had visions of my guardian angels at night in my bedroom that's a spiritually transformative mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. going through all of those and that's for another book that's because there's, <laughs> there's quite a few stories there yeah that's gonna be an awesome book yeah i love that i love that okay and um, so much so much information thank you so much mark um yes. and we really really appreciate you taking the time and to come and have to, uh, to just explain this and make it a little bit um, more um, tasty. <laughs> I want to leave with a, one, it's a big thing for us. One parting thought. This universe, everything in it, all of it is made from space. It's the only thing that really physically exists. Everything else is made from it. Know that and you will understand my theory perfectly. Everything comes from space. This real physical object that was created is God, in my opinion. Space is God. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's so true. Um, yeah, I'm going to be thinking about that for a while. <laughs> yeah. Down the uh, rabbit hole. <laughs> Thank you so much. And um, join us on the Breakthrough Network show, the Breakthrough Network. Um, take a look at them this every every morning at uh, 7 a.m. Uh, Eastern, I believe. It, Jessica Dua has her Project Joy. Live, join her live on her Facebook page or on the Breakthrough Network show uh, YouTube. Um, there's shows throughout the week. And uh, we're so excited to be part of that network. And thank you again, Mark. And we'll see you next Sunday. Okay. Oh, we oh, the winner. Oh, yeah. The winner okay. of the Soul Spa meditation is I'm gonna mess this up. I'm sorry. Uh nope. Gal Matsami, I think is how we say it. I'm not sure. But yes, so that's the winner. And uh thank you guys all for hanging out. And I think we're hoping we have Ron Schaefer next week. That's that's our tentative plan. If not, we will have a surprise. Yeah, because I'm not gonna be here. I'll be nope. up in the time. Yeah. So, yeah. Have a great week. Thanks everyone. Bye.